And please be seated and turn in your copies of God's Word to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. So tonight is a little bit of a summation moment, and then we're going to launch next week into a um, two or three, uh, maybe even four different series of sermons based on foundational sanctities from the book of Genesis. Uh, we are um, that flow out of this sanctity of gender and sanctity of life, uh, sanctity of sexuality and the sanctity of gender. Now, it doesn't take a great, um, a great mind, a social scientist, or, or even a, um, an extraordinarily quick uh, individual to know that we are in the middle of some tectonic uh, shifts in our culture. I mean, just extraordinary shifts. Uh, these are I mean, seismic in proportion, and the rapidity of it is um, astonishing. As some of you know, I do a 10-minute podcast Monday through Friday called Today in Perspective, which looks at cultural events and news items from a Christian world and life view with, um, and then tries to apply um, gospel solutions to it. And uh, people ask me, my goodness, uh, where do you come up with the stories? Our problem is not coming up with stories. It's how many do we have to discard? My goodness, it is uh, story after story after story. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to go to this series, because I noticed whether it was the sanctity of life, the sanctity of gender, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of family, the sanctity of work, the sanctity of um, the sanctity of rest, uh, Sabbath, all of those issues that once had a place and a beneficial blessing by God's common grace in our culture have not only been jettisoned, but we're in the midst of a cultural revolution. And in that cultural revolution, uh, there's a couple of things that came to my mind. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was the fact that the world sees it as a cultural revolution attempting to normalize the abnormal, attempting to remove shame and guilt from sin by making it acceptable and affirmable, to make it thinkable and doable. And then as the culture is doing that in its quote-unquote culture war, it is really attempting a revolution. A revolution, you have to remember this, a revolution is not a movement that's looking for acceptance. It's not a movement that's looking for accommodation. It's not a movement that is looking for toleration. A revolution is a movement that demands surrender. It demands that you condemn what you previously celebrated and you celebrate what you previously condemned. It is one, it is not looking for a place at the table, it is looking for capitulation by those who are at the table. And so that's what, um, that's what a revolution is about. But the second thing you have to remember, we can't get drawn into a culture war because we, from a biblical world in life, you realize this is not a culture war. On the contrary, this is a spiritual war for the souls of men and women. Culture is, merely, is profoundly, yet merely, the battlefield. The, um, that's where we enter into the public square in these matters. But the real issue comes down for the hearts and the souls of, of men and women. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle, wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness. And there is only one way that we can enter into it, and one is to be clothed with the spirit, is to be um, clothed with the righteousness of Christ and the armor of God, and then to not only put on the armor of God, but to also take up the divinely fashioned weapons of the spirit to enter into this. And every weapon designed by God and every piece of the armor all is drawn from the Word of God in the name of Christ. That's why God's Word is so crucial in these matters. I know what people are going to be facing. I'm glad that these are being recorded so that people can have access to them in the future uh, because I don't think, I don't, how are we going to respond to this moment? Well, let me tell you how some Christians are going to respond. Some Christians are going to respond by segregation. 
They're just going to try to ignore it and segregate themselves from it. And it's just, we'll get along. By the way, we're in a Bible-believing church. This isn't going to come in among us. This isn't going to be here. We're not going to have to deal with that. Let them all deal with this outside. Or we might even think regionally. It'll stay in other regions, but won't come to our region. And even if it comes to our region, we're within the people of God who love Jesus and love the Word of God. So it's not going to come to us. And so there is this notion that we can isolate ourselves. We can ignore it. We can just segregate ourselves uh, within, the, um, within perhaps a Christian ghetto, and it'll be okay uh, for us. But that's obviously not the case. That's why God warns us constantly. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 19, Leviticus 20. Here's what the nations do. Do not let it be named among you. Why would he tell them that? Because Satan is always wanting these things to be named among us. Always. Would you ever have thought that I would have had to deal with an issue as a minister of the gospel? Oh, let me, let me respect that. You probably don't sit around thinking much about what I have to deal with, so I'm sorry I said it that way. Uh, would I ever have thought that I would have to deal and nuance my way through someone who would take the name of, um, of rebellion against God and sexuality of same-sex activity and name themselves by that as an ordained minister. Would I ever have to uh, wrestle with that, nuance that, uh, walk my way through that as a, uh, as a uh, ordained minister of, in my denomination? The second thing, we, the second thing that Christians do is they just try to make peace with it, and that's accommodation. Uh, we'll just kind of, let's rethink it a little bit. I just did a program on the Anglican Church uh, in England, and um, one of their bishops had stood up and said just five, uh, uh, well, six years ago, listen, I want all of you to know that are engaged in the embrace of the LGBTQAI plus agenda that uh, it won't be long. You'll have your place among us. We just need to get a radical Christianity, a radical Christianity through our theology, through our traditions, through our, uh, through our worship, and through the wisdom of the 21st century. <laughs> well, let me explain something to you uh, in the Anglican Church, which has now, uh, both in leadership and membership, made peace with, uh, quote, with the myth of same-sex marriage. Um, how did they get there? Well, they didn't get there through Scripture. They didn't get there through tradition. The church hasn't, in any place, the church hasn't embraced anything other than, uh, anything other than a biblical sexual ethic that sex belongs within the context of a conjugal, heterosexual, monogamous, uh, marital relationship. So they couldn't, they, they, the scripture wasn't, gonna, wasn't going to let them become, quote, radical. The tradition of the church wasn't going to let them become radical. The stated common book of prayer was not going to let them become radical. But I'll tell you how they could become radical when they accommodate the culture in order to please the culture. It's what I call cultural magisterium. In the Reformation, the, the foundational issue of the Reformation is what was going to be the authoritative rule of faith and practice. Well, the reality is for the Christian, the authoritative rule of faith and practice is the Scripture, which is why Martin Luther said, unless I am convinced by Scripture, here I stand. Well. Well, the church was committed to clerical magisterium or, or ecclesiastical magisterium. But, uh, but the Christian says, no, the scripture alone is our only rule of faith and practice. But where is the evangelical church today? It's not the scripture alone. Oh, we nod our head to the scripture and we haven't changed our confessional statement about the scripture, but functionally now. What does the culture tell us to make room for? And it shows up in egalitarianism. It shows up in ordination standards. It shows up uh, with embracing 
ungodly biblical sexual activities and desires and quote unquote finding treasure in heaven from them, a treasure that will be in heaven from them. Well, that didn't come from the Bible. That came from cultural accommodation. So you have one group in the church says, we're going to remain pure by isolation and segregation. And we'll just ignore what's going on out there, but what's out there always comes in here. Secondly is accommodation. And then thirdly is just outright capitulation. Outright capitulation and surrender. As you see in the mainline Protestant church, as it surrendered to the pressures of liberalism, of theological liberalism, and now those churches are literally on the dustbin of history. So that's, that's, that's where we stand. Now, what is our answer to this? And I'm gonna just, I'm just going to tonight, um, let me just say where we're headed. Uh, in this matter of gender and sexuality, I want to do a short little couple of sermons on singleness uh, beginning next week. And then I wanna do some sermons on marriage uh, that, that takes a focus on biblical manhood and, and biblical womanhood. And what does that look like for a husband and a wife? What does it look like for a single man and a single woman? What does it look like for a husband and a wife? And then what does it look like in a father and in a mother and in parenting and in the family, the sanctity of family? And, uh, and then what does it look like as the Christian steps in the world? What is a Christian man who, who acts like a man and a Christian woman that acts like a woman? What does that look like? What are the markers in the world? Well, those are the things that I want to get to starting next week, but it has to come from a foundation. And unabashedly, I want to wrap up what we've been doing on the sanctity of gender and sexuality, because clearly we live in a day of of gender chaos, we live in a day of our gender confusion, and we live in a day massively such, massively such, and we live in a day of sexual, of sexual anarchy, gender confusion and sexual anarchy. Now, where do we start as believers? Well, folks, I am a very simple man who has been converted by the grace of God in a very complex world from highly besetting sins in my life. And I think there's no place better for me to start than the Word of God, that the Word of God is our only rule of faith and practice. What does the Bible tell us in what it says, how it says, how it says it? We believe in verbal plenary inspiration. Every word and the order of the words have been placed there by the hand of God, through the Spirit of God, through the human authors that he has chosen. And so that's simply where I would go in order to try to begin to understand this and in order to try to address this seismic shift that is all around us. In other words, a biblically framed Christian worldview. So let me give you five statements about gender and sexuality from which we will launch into biblical sexuality and biblical gender manifested in masculinity and femininity in the, in the uh, series that I just proposed to you. Number one, to understand gender, gender uh, to address the issue of gender confusion and to address the issue of uh, of uh, sexual anarchy, you've got to start here. It begins with the supremacy, sufficiency, and sovereignty of God as revealed in his word. That's where you must start. You start, not you start somewhere and get to God. You start with the sovereignty of God, the sufficiency of God, the supremacy of God, as he is revealed in his word. If you would go with me to Genesis 1-1, I'm gonna read three passages of scripture for you. How does the Bible set us on the origin of understanding the foundations of life in the book of Genesis? They're all over the place. The sanctity of 
creation, the sanctity of divine revelation, the sanctity of uh, the Sabbath, the sanctity of work, the sanctity of family, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of sexual, all of that is in the book of Genesis, which not accidentally is the most hated and attacked book in the Bible in this world. And probably no verse is more despised than this one. In the beginning, God. What do you start with? God. Nothing else is eternal. Only Him. Space, time, and matter are not eternal. Humanity is not eternal. Eternal, no beginning, no end. We have a beginning. The only one who is Alpha and Omega, the only one who is beginning and end, is God Himself. When beginnings began, they began, and God was and is. God was there. In the beginning, God created. He's not created, He creates. He creates the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, when you go to other passages, which I don't have time to do, I send you to them, John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, you see the Trinity in creation. God the Father authored it, God the Son accomplished it, and God the Holy Spirit ordered it, hovered it over it to bring it to order. It was formless and it was void. It was, it was unformed and unfilled, and then God made it unformed, and then God formed it in three days, and then God filled it in three days. And that's what God then do, did then how does he do it? And the phrase is constantly repeated. And God said. Everything that exists, exists by the spoken word of God. He spoke it into existence. Ex nihilo, from nothing, everything comes into existence from the eternal God. Now, for our sake, to take a look at gender and sexuality, advance yourself to Genesis 1, 26. To Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, and now we eavesdrop in on a conversation of the Trinity. And then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now you see the plural accommodating the doctrine of the Trinity. And, and let them, and now we see man is going to be plural. Man singular is going, God is one and there is plurality. We know that as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Man is one and there will be plurality. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, that is man, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over every and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every grain plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. 
So what do you begin with? You begin with the fact that there is God. God creates everything. And then the focus on the microscope of creation week comes to the sixth day. And we are told that God made man, male and female. And then the microscope is turned to another power as we see exactly how that occurs in Genesis chapter 2. And if you'll go down with me, uh, down to verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground of the heavens, <clears throat> out of the, I'm sorry, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Clearly there is the search for the helper completer that, the, uh, from the creation of God. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name, that man, that God had decreed man to have authority over these animals to define them, to name them. And then, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. None of them were good to complete him as a helper completer. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he, while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its, flesh, uh, its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Notice she shall be called Isha, reflection of, completer of, a mirror of, a woman, that woman because she was taken out of man. She's not man, she is woman, reflection of man, coming from man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So here we live, and I do not believe this is hyperbole. We live in a culture of insanity, absurdity, immorality, lethality that's rooted in profitability. Let me say it again. We live in a culture of insanity, absurdity, immorality, lethality, death, and it's rooted in profitability. Would you like to know how much money is being made in pornography? Would you like to know how much money is made in the myth of gender reassignment surgeries? Would you like to know how much money is being made in the culture of escapism through alcohol and drugs? It's absolutely astonishing, the profitability and the anticipation that Roe v. Wade may be overturned and some measure of sanity returned to some degree, an entire state is now using its tax money to make its state the abortion destination for any and all to come. It's devoting itself to creating the industry of abortion. Now we know it's already there through, uh, through organizations such as Planned Parenthood, but that's what it's going to do. Sin always has the roots. Do you want to know why when the gospel turned Ephesus upside down, why they had a riot? It was because people quit doing idolatry, which was big money. And silversmiths lost their job. Sin is rooted in profitability. All of that alphabet, LGBTQAI+, why do you think big business embraces it? It makes money. And so you have a culture of insanity, of 
absurdity, immorality, lethality, rooted in profitability. So how do you tackle it? Well, you tackle it with the gospel of grace, man by man, woman by woman, child by child, to win men and women to Christ and counsel and disciple them with all that Jesus commanded, including Genesis, the Word of God, with its sanctities. That's what God calls us to do. And where do you begin? You begin with the doctrine of God. The United States Senate does not own sexuality. The Supreme Court does not own sexuality. They did not originate it. They do not own it. Only God owns it because only God created it. God created man, male and female. He made man, male and female, in his image to bear his image. It's clear they're equal because they become one. Two entities that are not equal cannot become one. They may have a negotiated partnership of 60-40, but you can't become one unless you are equal. But you can't become one if you're the same. That's sameness, that's not oneness. Oneness is for two equal things that exist to unite intricately and intimately, indivisibly, as one. And God made man, two genders, male and female. Facebook may put up 59, but there's two. Facebook has no right to put up 59. Oh, it has the ability to do that, but it has no cosmic right to do that. And whenever you defy the Creator, that is cosmic treason and sin. And sin will bring death. What you begin with is not gender, nor the state, nor the family, nor marriage. You begin with God, who is, who was, and who is to come. God who is sovereign, God who is sufficient. He is the one who spoke and brought all things into existence, including man in two genders, male and female. So we begin with the, with the doctrine of God as he is revealed in his word. He originates everything, therefore he owns everything. He originates everything and owns everything, therefore he defines everything. He originates everything, owns everything, defines everything, therefore he directs the right use of everything. He is the creator, and when he has established his creation, he then sanctifies it in terms of definition and direction. That leads us to point two. Point two, heterosexuality in gender alone is natural by divine decree. Heterosexuality alone is natural by divine decree. Now it's not, it's in our sin, we invent all kinds of sexuality. There's homosexuality, there is bestiality, there is zoosexuality, there is transsexuality, there is uh, bisexuality, all of those are inventions of man's sin. They are, not, they are not establishing alternatives of sexuality. 
They are establishing cosmic treason against God, the Almighty. And when you break the decrees and law of God, eventually it will break you. Or might I quote from Romans 1, you receive the due penalty within your body. It is unavoidable. And not only physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. The only place sexuality is shameless is when God has established both its environment and its definition. It is only heterosexuality that is natural. Anything else will be full of shame. That brings me to the third. What is the environment for gender and sexuality to function? And that is marriage. That is the environment. Heterosexuality resides shamelessly within marriage. Heterosexuality resides shamelessly within marriage. Now, man in rebellion may embrace all kinds of sexuality and may embrace heterosexuality outside of marriage in promiscuity or unnatural sexuality. Well, Pastor, what are, is it unnatural if it's outside of marriage? Yes, it's unnatural because by definition it has to be outside of marriage. There is nothing more mythical than same-sex marriage. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is impossible. Marriage has been defined, owned, and created by God. You just read it. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Marriage is a covenantal monogamous, one man, one woman, heterosexual, conjugal relationship. None of the other unnatural sexualities can engage in a conjugal covenantal relationship as designed by God. Therefore, they are myths. Now, I understand the Supreme Court can declare them legal. I understand that senators and Republicans can vote for them to be legal. But by the definition of a biblical world in life view, what has been declared is a myth. It is an absolute myth. It is a fabrication. It is, not, it, it is, it is a full fabrication. The effort is to remove the shame by declaring it acceptable and legal. And while it may be legal by the law of the land, it is not acceptable and it is not in, ter it is not in conformity to God's revealed decrees from his creation of man, male and female, and marriage as the environment for that relationship. Any other marriage than a man and a woman in a covenantal relationship is an absolute fabrication, and it cannot remove the shame of sexuality outside of a heterosexual marital relationship. But don't miss the fact that Adam and Eve, as they come together in the first marriage, were naked and unashamed because they were where the relationship belonged. Intimacy, sexual intimacy between a man and a woman initiates the marriage, one flesh, recreates the marriage in ministry to one another, and then procreates from the marriage. That's what it is designed to do. It is designed to initiate the marriage, to recreate the marriage, let the marriage bed be held in honor among all. 
But fornicators and adulterers, any sexuality outside of the marriage bed, God brings judgment. So here is heterosexuality resides within marriage. Now we may establish a we may establish movements for our cultural revolution that claim we need two consenting adults can engage in the name of freedom. Well, to begin with, that's not freedom. Uh, freedom is an ordered liberty. All freedom is ordered liberty. That's not freedom, that's autonomy. That's self-rule. Freedom is the ability to operate within the divine mandates of the Creator in His creation law. Heterose that um, heterosexuality, it actually is not freedom. It is actually, as I've said, cosmic treason against the Almighty is what it is. And it is ultimately a declaration to God. We will not live as you created us to. We will not recognize the creator creation binary. And the way we will not recognize the creator creation binary, Genesis 1, is by denying every binary you've put in creation. Light and darkness, we will, we, male and female, we will deny every one of them and as paganism uh, strikes back with the worship of the creation itself. Uh, so now notice how this is. So please notice how God works. He created man. It's not good for the man, male image bearer, to be alone. Why? For two reasons. One, because man, male image bearer, doesn't properly image God. Number two, Male image bearer cannot do what I made him to do. I made him to have dominion over the earth. I made him to subdue the earth. I made him to fill the earth. That's why I made him from the earth, from the dust of the earth, because he was to subdue it. He was to fill it. He was to rule over it, but he can't without a suitable helpmate. But nothing else I've created is the super, is the helpmate. So now he needs someone who is his helper completer. So he then takes from Adam's side because she fits alongside of him. And he doesn't make another man. There will not be a same-sex marriage nor does he make two more individuals. He says no to bisexuality, nor does he make one, make one the same, but says inside there's something else, and he says no to transsexuality. And none of the beast, he says no to bestiality. And then he makes woman. And male and female, he then makes marriage. And you see how God is doing this in terms of creation and law. One of our great laws is the creation law of the Sabbath. And it pains me to see how we violate it so readily. But God says what? I didn't make man for the Sabbath. I made the Sabbath for man. When was man made? It's hitting hard. What day of the week? Sixth day. When was the Sabbath? Seventh. He didn't make Sabbath and then the man. He made the man. And then marriage. And then the Sabbath. And it is this order that God has given to us and displayed in every word and in the order of words within the scripture itself. So heterosexuality is natural, but only to be embraced within marriage. And why does marriage exist? For two reasons. Number one, marriage is God's gift to us as the foundational relationship in humanity. It is foundational to all other relationships. 
It sets the pattern for the church. It sets pattern for society. It sets patterns for government. In the, this relationship that we are to have of office and submission, of leadership and followership, all of that is built into the context of the family that sets the pattern for life. And then as marriage is made for that, for the foundation of life, we then find out there was something even greater. Marriage was put into the creation in anticipation of redemption, that God was going to establish a covenant of grace, and God was going to save his bride through his son. A son will leave his father, go to the cross to purchase and cleave to his bride, and nothing can separate us from Christ, our bridegroom, and we who are washed with the water of his word. It's not Jesus came into the world and God looked around and said, you know, I need an illustration. I need an illustration for this covenant relation. Hey, marriage, that'll be a good one. No, it was right from the beginning. Marriage was placed in the creation in order to give us the picture of redemption, of a covenant-keeping God who will purchase and keep his bride and will have her with intimacy, union with Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. And there are no grounds for divorce. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ, in the glorious marriage of eternity, which we will enjoy in the consummation at the marriage feast of the Lamb. So there is why marriage exists and then as it exists, it is the place where gender and, and sexuality allow us to be drawn together in the glorious uh, blessings of intimacy before the Lord. This gender sexuality, male and female become one as the marriage is initiated, as the marriage is recreated, and as the marriage procreates to the glory of God. And then number four, number four, the only shameless sexuality is marital sexuality. Any sexuality outside of marriage will be shameful, whether it is unnatural sexuality of homosexuality, uh, bisexuality, bestiality, uh, uh, transsexuality, or even if it is the natural sexuality of heterosexual in promiscuity that is premarital or extramarital sexuality. Any of that outside of that will always bring shame. You know, I have, um, I have uh, done the reading I'm supposed to do as a pastor. And I have spent, I don't know how much time in counseling. And many times as we're dealing with the sins of sexual immorality, of either promiscuity or abnormalities, unnatural sex, the thing the government and the Supreme Court and the Senate can pass whatever laws they want. Whenever it occurs outside of marriage, there is the sense of the shame. How many have told me, I went home and just cut on the shower and sat down. Please wash it away. Please wash it away. The only place it is found shamelessly and gloriously is in a marriage in which the husband's sexuality is marshaled to bless his wife and the wife's sexuality is marshaled to bless her husband. 
The body of the husband belongs not to him, but to his wife. The body of the wife belongs not to her, but to her husband. What that saying is, all of those created desires are there not to use the other person for your gratification, but to give yourself to the other person for their blessing. And then comes the glorious truth. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So it is, it, is that, it is that location for the gender and sexuality to be embraced, guided by biblical, redemptive gospel truth. And then number five is this. It is the gospel that is the double cure for the insanity, absurdity, lethality, immorality, and even the profitability of this cultural moment. It is the gospel. Would you take your Bibles in closing and read one verse with me? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Some of you are aware of it, but please just read it with me just for one reason. Would you go with me there? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There wasn't a place that was more inundated with immorality than Corinth. In fact, that was to be called a Corinthian was like being called a, um, a, a sex criminal almost. <clears throat> and uh, so, but the gospel had done its work there. And here is the Apostle Paul when he's speaking to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And if you would, uh, go with me down to verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, so, there, so you are not your own, for you have been bought with a glorious price. You see the call to biblical sexuality? Now, let me show you what precedes that call to obedience, that call to gospel transformation. What precedes it is gospel declaration. Look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? By the way, note that. He's, notice he doesn't say, do you not know that the righteous can earn their way into the kingdom? No, the only way you get into the kingdom is inheritance. It's a gift of grace. But who is it that's going to get the gift of grace? Who is it that's going to be in the everlasting kingdom? Well, not the unrighteous. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers who will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. There's your washing, not the shower. Here's your washing, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And that's where I just simply want to end with you. Do not read that and say, oh, after you're converted, you live a perfect life and that's why you go to heaven. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the righteous go to heaven. Well, my righteousness at any point in time in my Christian life is like what? Filthy rags. He's not speaking of your righteousness. He's speaking of Christ's righteousness. You were washed. You were justified. We who were guilty are now innocent. Why? Because when you come to Christ, your sin record is taken away and his righteousness clothes you. And you were not only justified, you were sanctified. That's what you were 
Why would we ever identify ourselves with what we were? This is not saying you don't have to fight indwelling sin on your way to heaven. This is not saying that there's not going to be temptations outside and temptation. That's not what it's saying. What it is saying, when you get converted, you have a new standing, no condemnation. The righteousness of Christ is yours. And you have a new reigning power. No longer does sin reign over you. No longer do you live under the dominion of sin. Now you live under the dominion of grace. It's not saying that you don't have sin living in you. It's not saying that you don't have entangling sins that kept reaching out to pull you back. But it is saying you are no longer the victim of the guilt, the shame, nor the power of sin. You are now in Christ, Christos Victor. You can kill sin in desire, word, and deed on your way to heaven. And you are definitively sanctified in Christ. You are gloriously justified in Christ. And now sin no longer has dominion over you. Now you can grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And I've recently been exposed to a book that says, quit telling those sexual, immoral, addicted people that they can be cured. Just care for them. I care for them. I love them. I've had the privilege to minister on many occasions to them. And because I care for them, I tell them there's a gospel that has a double cure. It cleanses you from sin's guilt and its power. Therefore, we can now be men of God and women of God who live as God calls us with increasing faithfulness and obedience by the grace of God who has made us right with God through his righteousness, through his atoning death, and through the indwelling sin power breaking of the Holy Spirit, born again, regenerated and justified. If any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And Jesus is at work in you, making all things new. Father, thank you for the time we could be in your word tonight. Thank you for the privilege to walk our way through this uh, wonderful, glorious uh, passages of Scripture to try to place this uh, within a God-centered, God-defined, biblically-defined world and life view as we minister caringly and we don't have a gospel to cope. We've got a gospel with a hope. You can be right with God and God will be right within you. Praise his name forevermore. Amen. Thank you